and removes every care he bears all my cumbering load in a pathway replete with his love are my feet since he put my sins under the blood they are covered by the blood they are covered by the blood my sins are all covered by the blood mine iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last my sins are all covered by the blood let's sing verse two one more time is this your testimony from the burden I carry now I am set free for Jesus has lifted my load oh the love and the grace I received in its place when he put my sins under the blood they are covered by the blood they are covered by the blood my sins are all covered by the blood mine iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last my sins are all covered by the blood amen amen you may be seated if your sins are covered by the blood it's more than just a one-time experience, it's a lifestyle, and we want to live for Jesus. Number 333, we'll sing this song, Living for Jesus, and the chorus of this, I hope, is your prayer tonight. I give myself to you. I own no other master but you tonight. Living for Jesus. Number 333. Live.
Amen. Someone requested this song tonight, number 70, It Is Well With My Soul. This is a familiar song, but it is the result of living a life for Christ. When we've given our lives to him and we're living a life for him, then whatever may come our way, we have the hope. We have hope in this, in this world because it is well with our soul, but we have hope of eternity with him, and that makes all the difference. It is well with my soul. and it might be hard, but would you stand with me on these last couple of verses? Let's lift up his name tonight. Sin is defeated. The victory is won. It can be well in our souls tonight. My sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, God, please remain standing for prayer. The God who is able to cover our sins with his blood, the one who is able to witness to our hearts that it's well with our souls, is the one that's able to meet every need that we have. 
And as we go to him in prayer tonight, we invite you to bring your burdens, your needs, your cares to him this evening. Brother Bruce Harper, lead us in prayer, would you please? Our Heavenly Father, it is joy this night to come into thy presence, yes, yes. just to feel your presence and to feel the, the beauty of the experience with Christ. Yes. We thank you for the joy and peace that you have given us. We thank you for our dear brother who has come to share with us yes, yes. from his heart. We just thank you that uh, you, you have uh, given him to us, and we just want to bathe once more in your presence this night. Hear from you. Hear from heaven. Amen. Amen. Those wonderful words that you have prepared for our hearts. We just pray this night for the many requests that uh, we're aware of. We think of Evie. We think of uh, Doris and so many others that are going through tough times physically. And uh, we just want to pray for them in a special way that your hand of mercy, your hand of healing, your hand of grace would rest upon them this yes, night. Yes, yes. We pray for the remainder of the revival services, that hearts would be stirred, that those yes, would yes. see the brochures that are out there, may be attracted to that, and may come looking for something that uh, they do not feel at the present. And we just pray if there are those here tonight that have not made their peace with you, yes, yes, that Lord. this would be the night that it begins, that Grand this Lord. night they may find you as their Lord and their Savior. We just pray all these things in your matchless and holy name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Again, we want to thank you for coming tonight. I know it's Friday night. I know there's many places you could be. But thank you for coming to Tent Meeting Night, and I trust you've come with a heart that's open to what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us about tonight. It's been a delight to have Pastor Doug and Amy bring us the special music, and they're coming at this time to do that.
That's why he died on Calvary. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. Oh, So thankful that God loved us so much that no matter where we are in life, he is after us and wants us as one of his children. It's a delight this weekend to have a Dr. Mike Avery and good to have his wife also Ruth with us. And uh, he's going to come at this time and minister the word again. Open your hearts, open the word of God, let the spirit of God speak to you tonight. And if whatever God says, if you'll just say yes, you'll go home Encourage, and you'll go home a better person than you came. God bless you, Dr. Avery. Thank you, Pastor Bob, and good evening. That bad, huh? It's Friday night. It's a little warm, but, uh, you know, we're doing God's work in God's way under this beautiful little white tent, and... Uh, It'll soon be over. So what do you say we put our hearts into this service tonight? Amen? Amen. Isn't it good to be a Christian? Yes. To, you know, if, in, in witnessing to your neighbors, is there enough joy and happiness in your life to sort of attract them to what you've got? Uh, boy, did, did I kill the meeting on that one statement? <laughs> it got really, really quiet. But uh, it's so good to be a Christian to have a life where there is no condemnation whatsoever. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15 tonight. If you know your New Testament, you know what Luke chapter 15 is famous for. It's famous for the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. I really wish that parable, if it was going to be named anything, it would have been named the parable of the father's heart. The father's mentioned a dozen times, far more than any other character in that story. And it's really an, ex, an expose on the love of a father's heart. But uh, what I want you to do is I want to start at the beginning of that chapter. So just open up to Luke 15 and uh, hang on, hold your place. There was a little boy sitting in his, the den of his grandfather's home, drawing furiously with his color something on the floor. His grandfather was so intrigued by this young artist being so busy doing something, he walked over and he looked down and he said, Son, what are you drawing? He said, Why, Papa, I'm drawing a picture of God. And his grandfather looked down quite puzzled and he said, Why, I didn't know, I didn't know anybody knew what he looked like. To which the little boy responded, they said, they will when I'm done drawing him. <laughs> you know, as funny as that is, we've all drawn a picture of God in our hearts already. You have, I don't mean a picture like you see in church with a smiling Jesus or a, or a sort of a melancholy Jesus is what we normally see, this, this uh, solemn appearance 
I don't mean that. I don't mean a picture of him hanging on the cross. But we all have this picture. It's really more like a narrative about God in our head. And in computer language, that becomes the default mode of our entire spiritual life. That's sort of the foundation. Everything that we do spiritually, every thought that we think sort of goes right back and rests and is interpreted through the view of God, the picture of God that we've drawn in our minds. That's why the the great preacher A.W. Tozer made that famous statement. He said, the most important thing about you is what you think when you think about God. He actually went on to say, he said, if I can rightly determine a man's thoughts about God, I could probably rightly determine his destiny. What we think about God is absolutely crucial. Anglican Bishop William Temple said it like this in sobering terms. He said, if your concept of God is wrong, the more religion you get, the more dangerous you become to yourself and to everybody else. Knowing God rightly is crucial. I did a test when I was president at GBS. I always had what I called a D group, just a discipleship group. They met in our home usually either every Wednesday night or every other Wednesday night. I had usually about a dozen guys and girls, and we'd have fellowship together at the table. We'd move into the living room and sit around the, uh, the living room, sometimes the fireplace if it was cold, and we'd just talk about life. We'd talk about spiritual things. And I had just read uh, Brian Smith's book, The Good and Beautiful God, and so I took a little illustration out of that book, and I said to my D group that was circled around me, I said, if God suddenly chose to incarnate himself again in human flesh and walk through the front door into the foyer, turn, walked into this living room and looked directly at you, right at you, what would the expression on his face be? What would it say if he looked right at you? And I turned to the first lady that was sitting there, Marika, she's a missionary in Africa, South Africa now, she's a South African, Afrikaans. And I said, Marika, what would the expression on his face say? Marika, who's a straight-A student, top-of-the-line kid, deeply spiritual, said, she dropped her head and she said, I'm afraid he would say, Marika, you can do better. You can do better. And some version of that answer came out of every student's mouth. Do you know the reason they said what they said? It's because they had a certain view of God in their head. They said what they said because in their mind, God is some form of a micromanaging perfectionist looking down saying, okay, Vernon, let's, 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 let's work on this. I believe you can beat that. I know you're trying, but you hadn't got, hadn't got there yet, hadn't quite measured up. Sort of a rule-oriented, shame-based religion that you never, ever, ever measure up, no matter how hard you try. That's why getting the right view of God is so crucial. Because it profoundly affects the way you relate to God. I saw an interview of the last survivor of the death camps in Poland, Auschwitz. And uh, help me, honey, with the other one. The other main camp. No. Birkenau. 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 They brought him in their own. Hey, thanks, Neil. They brought him in their own railroad cars, emptied them out, separated. She was just a small eight-year-old girl when she deboarded that train along beside her mother and her little brother and her father. Her father was put in on one side with the men. Her mother and her and the little baby was put on the other side. 
Somehow the baby disappeared. They never saw him again. Her father disappeared, never saw him again. Of course, you know, those were the death camps. If you were able to work, you worked. If you weren't, you were burned. And she said, I, like any Jewish girl, I had my little, she had somehow able to get part of the Torah with her. She had some scriptures. And she said, I, would, I, I had them hid in the latrine. And I would slip to the latrine when I could. And I would uncover them where I had them hid. And I would read a little bit of the Torah. And I would say some prayers to God. But she said, as I looked around me and I saw what was happening, my faith began to slip. And she said, one day when I was walking across camp, going from one job to the next, she said, I saw a truck pulling a big trailer come up the main part of camp. And she said, the trailer was filled, piled high with bodies of little children. And she said, one of the bodies up on top had not yet died and was wiggling and it fell off right in front of me. He said they stopped the truck, came out, the guard picked the child up by its heels, banged its head against the rim of the tire, threw it back on the trailer. And here's what she said. She said, when I witnessed that, I stopped talking to God and I never talked to him again in her mind God was to blame in her mind it was God's doing in her mind that was a God problem and that view she had of God prohibited her heart from ever opening up and saying anything else to him again No, I'm not talking to people who've witnessed that kind of slaughter. But I'm talking to men and women here tonight who have a view of God in your head. And it ranges from almost to where she is. I'm so angry at him, I'm never going to say again. The the life I've had to live, the home I've had to live in, the way I was brave. I'm mad at God. I don't want to talk to him. All the way to the other extreme... That God just kind of winks at anything I do and I'll slip in the back door of heaven somehow. That's quite a spread. But we all have a picture of God in our head. And that picture profoundly affects how we relate to him. That is why. That is actually why Jesus came and the biggest problem he ever had was preaching to those who were part of institutionalized religion, the scribes, the Pharisees. And that's why we come to Luke chapter 15. Because the very first opening verses, here's what it says. You have your Bible, Eddie. You couldn't get any lower than a renegade Jew who had become a Roman tax collector. They were on the very bottom. You didn't even spit on them. The tax collectors and the sinners, they got ranked a little higher than the tax collectors. The tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. I was sitting here a moment ago, and these big lights up here are already start to attracting the the bugs and the fields around. It's amazing how a bug is just drawn to a light. Sinners were drawn that same way to Jesus. They were just drawn to him. And when they would come around and he would talk with them and engage with them and and possibly even pat them on the back or, or scuff their hair and talk to them, the scribes and the Pharisees stood over, stroking their beards, arms crossed, solemn, angry looks on their face, and they often had this to say, They would say, why this man eats with sinners. Well, on this occasion, Jesus was close enough to hear them make the statement. And they were close enough for him to respond. And the Bible says, when they made that statement, verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them, saying, And then he tells the story of the guy who has a hundred sheep, 
one goes astray. Now, okay, let's have a little bit of a dialogue here tonight. Can we do that in Pennsylvania under a white tent? Is that possible? Do the Pennsylvania Dutch, uh, are, you, are you open enough to talk in church? Well, one or two are. <laughs> because of their skewed view of God, he spake this parable. And it's the parable of the guy with a hundred sheep. And one of them goes astray. He strays off somewhere. We don't know. And what does the shepherd do? He leaves those that were secure. And what, what does he do? Come on. He goes after this one little lost lamb. And it, they find, he finds him. And obviously he's hurt himself. He's done something stupid and he's hurt himself. And so what does he do? Come on, come on, come on, come on. He picks him up and he puts him on his shoulder and he brings him back to the sheepfold and he puts him in with the sheep and whatever else needs to be done. Then he sends out the word and says, I found my lost sheep. And what did he do? He rejoices about the one little lost sheep that's come home. And he didn't stop. Jesus got on a roll and he said, and, and he spoke another parable. And this time, it, it, it was sort of appeal to the women. And he said, there was a woman who had 10 coins, and she lost one. And one of those coins, the coin that she lost was about equal to a month's wage. That's a lot of money to lose. And so what does the story say she did? She, she lost the coin. What did she do? What? Okay, don't paint with a broad brush. Let's go by. The, she lights the lamp. She moves furniture. She sweeps the house. And she finds that coin then what does she do no 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 she calls all the neighbors and says let's have a party come rejoice with me i found my coin and he keeps going he's on a roll now and he really the next story he really exposes his heart he talks about a man who had two sons and the Bible is written in context. It's not just a book out of context. It has context. And the context of this story was a Jewish family. And in the, con and in, in the context of American family, if, if, I happened, you know, if I happened to be Vernon's son and I said, Vernon, okay, I want my inheritance. Pay up. He'd just go write a big check and hand it to me. But in a Jewish context... That was impossible. You didn't have checks. You didn't have banks. The wealth, the inheritance was in the property. It was in the cattle. It was in the sheep. It was in the farmland. It was all in hard assets. No liquid assets whatsoever. Very small amount. And it was completely unheard of for such a thing to ever happen. It just never happened. It would have been blasphemy for something like that to some kid to say that to his half this farm and get my inheritance. We don't know how it happens. Jesus doesn't say, but he obviously sells some land, some sheep, some, he does something and he gives the boy his inheritance and he goes into that far land. You know the story. He wasted. He finally comes to his senses and he starts thinking about his father. And here's what he thinks about his father. He said, my father treats his servants better than I'm living. My father, if I go to him and say, father, I'm sorry, I, I'm ashamed. I don't want to, I, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. He said, my father will hear me. He will listen to me. He knew that about his father. And so he starts that long journey. And what does the story tell us about the father? When this boy starts home, what do we, what's the first thing we pick up? What happened? He what? He saw him from a long way off. What does that mean? It means he was looking. It means he was watching for him. And then what does the Bible say? He saw. He he ran. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
We're talking about some dusty old creature who could hardly, arthritic and could hardly get around. And can you imagine him pulling up that old long gown that Jews wear and tucking it into his belt and scooting down the road, kicking up dust in those things? Threw his arms around him. Scholars who know this story, who know the context, who know the culture said more than likely one of the reasons the father did that was to save him from the neighbors who would have killed the son for what he did to his dad. They would have stoned him. But he runs to him, throws his arms around him. And then what does he do? He what? No, not yet. (laughs) You're a party. It's coming, but not now. It's coming. Hang on. What does he do? He kisses him. Well, the, this is where the English gets beggarly. You, you can't see it in, 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 you can't see the original language here. It's in the present tense. He literally smothered him with kisses. It's like the little girl said, Daddy, you're kissing my face off. <laughs> Kiss, he just kept kissing him. He kissed him and kept kissing him and kept ki- He smothered him with kisses. And all the time this boy is babbling and he's crying and he's trying to say, Dad, I'm so sorry. I've blown it. I've done something so stupid. Please forgive me. I don't even need to be a son. Just make me a servant. Father was hardly even listening. He was kissing him. They were running up the road. He had stopped and kissed him and he was happy. He got up the road and finally the servants had gathered around and he said, get my boy some shoes. Get a fresh robe and put on him. Bring that signet ring back there that identifies him with the family. Bring that out. Get it back on his hand. My son that was lost is found. My son that was dead is now alive. Let's rejoice. Let's have a party. Let's kill the fatted calf. One of the most interesting things that connects every one of these stories is joy. Rejoicing over that what was lost is found. And some people have a hard, hard time believing that the God you and I love and worship is the most joyful being in the whole universe. <laughs> I lost you on that one right there. Let me say it again. He's the most joy-filled being in the whole universe. The Bible says he even sings over us. Wow. So what do we learn about God here other than the things we picked up in the story? Well, there are four simple things we learn about God in this story. First of all is he's a God that receives. He's a God who has arms wide open. Hoping. <laughs> oh, how many of you have a welcome mat out in front of your house? Come on, let's see some hands, Pennsylvania. Come on. What does it say? What does it say? What? Welcome to our home or something like that. Welcome. Do you mean it? Do you mean it? Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. What you mean, what you mean is, welcome to a room in my home. That's what you mean. You can welcome to the living room, maybe the kitchen, maybe the dining room, but you don't mean welcome to my home. You don't mean you're going to throw the doors open. Here's the bedroom. Here's the bathroom. Here's the dresser drawers. Help yourself. Go anywhere you want to go. That's not what you mean. But when we talk about a God that receives, a God that welcomes, he's a God that throws out his arms to all of our junk, to all of our baggage, to all of our brokenness, to all of our sin. He throws out his arms for all of that hurt and heartache and disaster. Do you know of all the gods, all the little gods in our world? He's the only God that says, come. All the rest of the gods say, go. Do, do penance, do this, bring fruits, bring offerings. But our God, he's the only God that says, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Years ago, when Thomas Jefferson was president, he and his cabinet had to ride out of Washington and crossing one of the local rivers that was easy to flood when it rained. 
They rode out one afternoon, spent the night somewhere, and they, had to, they were coming back the next morning, and it rained overnight, and the river had, was flooding its banks. The only way to cross that river when it was flooding its banks was on horseback. And one man who was walking and traveling alone, he was standing there at the bank of the river, and he couldn't get across. The river was flooded. He needed a horse or somebody to, to ride him across. And all of a sudden, six horsemen he heard coming in the distance. He heard the hooves clopping and hitting the hard ground. It was Jefferson and his cabinet. He had no idea who they were. He was standing there, and as the first horseman, member of the cabinet, rode up, he looked up into the man's face, and the face looked down at him, and the man just jumped, plunged into the river, rode his horse across, got on the other side. One after the other, they did, until now it's the last man, the last horse. He rides up to the edge of the river, the man standing there, the man looks up in his face, and suddenly his countenance breaks with a smile, and he said, Sir, would you give me a ride across? And the man said, So, of course. He took his foot out of the stirrup, and the man got put one in and jumped on the back of that horse. They rode across, got on the other side, and he put the man down. By that time, the other five had circled back and sort of formed a half circle. One of those men spoke, and he said to the the man on foot, he said, why did you do what you just did? Why didn't you ask one of us to do that? Don't you know who you just asked to take you across the river? He said, I have no idea who I just asked to take me across the river, but I know why I did what I did. He said, because I looked at all of your faces, and you said no on them. But I looked at his face. And it said, yes. When you look at God's countenance, it will always say yes. He's a God that receives. But not only is he a God that receives, he's a God that retrieves. He's a God that will go looking for you. Someone said, if I study this and study theology and study my Bible, do you think I can find God? That's the absolute wrong question. The question is, can you actually escape him? You can't. God is a God that takes the initiative. He is after us. He is seeking us. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, while you are seeking me, I will be found. Don't you ever worry. Anybody who ever seeks God will find him. It's absolute heresy to say it otherwise. While you are seeking me, I will be found. He's a God that retrieves he goes after you longtime friend of mine reverend gary Brueger. we've traveled the world together we've preached together we've worked together in the same denomination i remember gary telling me when he was just a young pastor in middle to northern ohio he said he was praying and somehow he saw in the paper an advertisement about jerry lee lewis If you know the one I'm talking about, Jerry Lee Lewis was a piano player, a singer. He was actually Jimmy Swagger's first cousin. Grew up in the same little hometown, same little Pentecostal church. Jimmy Lee Lewis was in a nightclub in Covington, Kentucky, right across the river from GBS. He was playing that weekend, singing. God said to Gary, I want you to go now and talk to Jerry Lee Lewis about his soul. Now... For most folks, and probably for me, I'd have said, did I hear that right? But Gary went down. Shows up at this nightclub, never been to one before. Didn't know what to do. Standing outside, and he said some guy figured out was the bouncer. Standing in the door. And the bouncer looked at him. He said, "Uh, you need some help, sir? He said, I certainly do. He said, I'm a preacher. I don't know much about these places, but God spoke to me, and he wants me to talk to Jerry Lee Lewis. Now, if that had happened here outside your church or your home, you'd have got a shotgun and called 911. But the bouncer said, uh, okay, you stay put. I'll be right back. And the bouncer goes in, starts talking to this one, and finally they actually get to Jerry Lee Lewis between performances. And says, Lewis, there's this guy out here, this preacher, who says God wants him to speak to you. Jerry Lewis knew the language, raised in church. And he said, bring him on in, set him down here at my table right at the front. 
They brought Gary in, set him down at the front table, and Jerry Lewis went back. He was performing, sang some songs, whatever he does. And again, another intermission. And he said, Jerry Lee Lewis walks down, reaches over, shakes Gary's hand, said, well, preacher, appreciate you coming. What can I do for you? And Gary said, Mr. Lewis, God sent me here to talk to you about your soul. And Jerry Lee Lewis looked at Gary, and he said, sir, thank you for coming. He said, but I want you to know there's not a single day of my life that God doesn't talk to me, and I don't sense and know what I need to do about my soul. It's called the law of the second witness. You're never the first one there. God always, he's always ahead of you. He's always ahead of you. You say, I don't know if I should go written to that person or not. Go ahead, you'll be the second. God's always there. He's already been there. God is a God that retrieves. He goes after people. That's why some of you sitting in this tent tonight feel a mysterious drawing in your heart toward God. His spirit is already retrieving. He's not only a God that receives and a God that retrieves, but he's a God that redeems. He redeems. He takes messes, broken we walk right down through it. He saw, he ran, he embraced, he kissed. He's a God that redeems, a God that forgives, a God that takes the messes we make in our life and turns everything all the way around, a God that redeems. And you know, just in case we wouldn't get it, he took a minor prophet to tell that whole story. God was endeavoring to show his people, Israel, I'm a redeeming God. No matter what you've done. Do you remember the story in the book of Hosea? Can you imagine Hosea the prophet when God says, I want you to go marry this particular woman named Gomer. She had a very shady past. We're very uncertain about her. And, Ho and Hosea goes and marries Gomer. He takes Gomer as his wife. The first son is born and they give him a name. And the second child is born and it's a daughter. And then the third child, it's a boy, is born. And God said, name him. And it's the Hebrew word for not mine. Hosea knew the first two was his. Wasn't sure about the third one, but now he knew. Gomer was playing the prostitute. Shortly after that child was born, Gomer's gone. Hosea wakes up one morning and the other side of the bed is empty. The children are crying. Gomer's gone. Several years pass. He picks up word here and there. Gomer first was a mistress. And then when the guy wearied with her and used her for what he wanted, she had to end up in prostitution. And it was one man after the next, and one blow after the next, and one heartache after the next, and month after month, and an awful, shameful prostitution. And finally, she comes to the place she's no longer even wanted in prostitution. And so there's only one thing to do, and that's put her on the block and sell her as a slave. And God said to Hosea, I want you to go and buy her back. Hosea goes down to the auction where they're selling the slaves. And there on the auction block, as was the custom, stood his wife, Gomer, stripped naked, a body that showed all the marks of a horrible life. Soars across her body from the diseases, from the beating, from the malnutrition. There she stood naked, bare, ashamed, with her head down. And the auctioneer says, what do I hear for this woman? And Hosea instantly bids. And someone says, oh, I'll give her, I'll, I'll pay five shekels for her. And Hosea said, I'll give 15 shekels. 
Someone said, I'll give 15 shekels and a bushel of barley. Hosea said, I'll give 15 shekels, a bushel, and a half barley. And the auctioneer said, you've won the bid. In today's money, he paid about $15 and a bushel of barley to buy her back. And he took her back. And he said, you'll no longer be for other lovers, but you're only going to be for me. And that's when God launches into that amazing story. He uses Israel's pet name, Ephraim. He's not talking about the tribe. He's talking about the pet name for Israel. And he said, Ephraim, Ephraim, how can I let thee go? Even though I've given you a bill of divorcement, if you will turn, I will take you back. God is a God that's anxious to redeem. I don't know who you are here tonight. You say, Brother Avery, don't. Uh, I don't profess to be a Christian, but don't call me that. Don't call me a gomer. You know, it's interesting. Some people, some people truly do. They stand at the bottom of stars. No one can save himself. I don't care how good you think you are or how high you think you are. You're in the same position as the guy at the bottom of the mine. We're lost and undone. And no one can save himself. It's only through grace, by faith, in Christ alone, you or I can be redeemed. He's a God that redeems. But not only that, he's a God that that restores. He said, I'll take you back. Put shoes on your feet. Put a robe about you. Mark you with a family signet. I will take you back. I was preaching in these one of the beautiful valleys here in Pennsylvania. Not this one, just I couldn't tell you where it is, but one of these beautiful valleys you've got all over your state. Down in the heart of one of those little valleys, a little white frame church, I showed up on a Monday night, spoke from Jeremiah chapter 18. I talked about the God who delights in new beginnings, the story of the potter, the clay. God can remake anything. And I told that story, and somewhere in that message, I said something like this. I said, even a senior citizen can have a brand new beginning. Didn't even realize I'd said it. But what I did know, there was an 89-year-old woman, charter member of the church. I mean, she could have been the poster gal for that little church. Everything in place, everything just right. But I did notice something very obvious about her. She had no joy whatsoever at all. She looked like a monument sitting over there. I went to her as I have done here every night. I went to her to shake her hand on the first night to speak to her. She slowly oscillated her neck at me, reluctantly lifted her hand and shook my hand. I don't think she said a word. I noticed in the song service she didn't sing. I noticed at the time when they asked for testimony, she didn't say anything. She just sat there, kind of looked straight ahead. I preached. I thought, this woman must be blind. She's just staring straight ahead. After the service, she left. The second night, same thing. No singing, no joy, no nothing. Charter member. The third night, I was standing at the foyer of the church. She walks through the door. Instantly, I knew there was something different about this woman. Instantly. Her countenance was bright. She actually had her face. She could actually smile. And she had a smile on her face. And she walked over to me. I didn't get to say anything. She stuck out her hand. She grabbed my hand, vigorously shook it. She said, Brother Avery, boy, have I got something to tell you. And she told me the story right there in the foyer before anybody else came. She said, Brother Avery, the very first night you were speaking out of Jeremiah and you said God can even give a senior citizen a new beginning. And I just nodded my head. I agreed. I didn't really know I said it. And she said, 
The Holy Spirit took that. Like an arrow, it was shot to my heart. And she said, that troubled me. It troubled me Monday night and Tuesday night. And she said, somewhere in between Tuesday night when I went to bed, around 2 o'clock Wednesday morning, I woke up and God spoke to me about my heart. And she said, I got down by my bed. And she said, I was on my knees for probably two hours or more. But she said, I finally acknowledged to God and admitted to God I had been backslidden in my heart. I had grown bitter at members of my family, particularly her husband and a son. And I had simply lost all the joy in my life. And she said, but Brother Avery, God gave me a new beginning last night. He took me back. He restored that joy in my heart. And I mean, she came. She told me that story. She went up to her seat. When the song leader announced what song we were going to sing, guess what she did? She opened up that book and that old walrus wrinkled face began to spread out. Those teeth began to shine. And she sang with all of her heart. And then the pastor said, anybody got a testimony tonight? I mean, she was the first one on her feet. She said, oh, brother. And she, and she told the whole church just what she told me back in the four. The last word she spoke was, God gave me a new beginning. Amen. And when Sunday night was over and I said goodbye, the last thing I remember seeing about her is she shook my hand with a big smile on her face. And she said, Brother Avery, God has just given me a new beginning. He's a God that restores. What kind of God do you have in your head? What kind is he? Well, let me tell you something. He's a God that receives. He's a God that retrieves. He's a God that redeems. And he's a God that restores. That's the kind of God he is. Some of you here tonight have never known his redemption. You've never known what it really means to have your sins forgiven and your heart set free from the bondage of sin. Some of you have known that, but it's been away somewhere in the past. You have bought into a culture and a creed of your church and your religion. But whatever joy there was left you a long time ago. And you sit here tonight. You fit the culture. You fit the creed. But you got an empty heart. And it's showing on your face. The joy is gone. But I got good news. That's not a problem to God because he's a God that restores. I want you to stand. I want you to bow your heads, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just praying, waiting on God. The whole point of pitching this little tent is a gospel meeting where the good news gets proclaimed. And here's the good news. You don't have to try to save yourself. You don't have to do penance. You don't have to do anything. You know why? Because it's already been done for you through the cross of Christ. What do you do? You confess. You acknowledge. I am what you say I am, Lord. I want you to save me. And by grace, through faith, (coughs) in Christ alone, he will take you right into his family. If you say, Brother Avery, that's what it used to be, but I've sort of lost that in my heart. Well, you can find your way back home tonight because he's a God that will take you back and a God that will restore. Our heads are bowed. The 
pianist playing, the invitation, music is wafting all through the little tent. Anybody here tonight and say, this is my night, this is for me. I want to step forward. I want to come to Christ. Whatever that means for the first time or for renewal, whatever that means, who wants to come first? Tonight, 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 tonight. Who else? Who else wants to step out? <laughs> Come forward. The pastor's here. Associates are here. And they're ready to pray with you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? The Holy Spirit's here reaching out, retrieving, drawing. If you draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. All done? Anybody else here tonight? Brother Avery, I, I just want to I want to know Jesus. And I'm gonna come tonight and give my heart to him. Put my faith in what he's done on the cross. I want to do that tonight. Anybody else? Anybody else? All done? We're going to pray then for a dismissal prayer so you can go. But just before we pray, our heads are still bowed, our eyes still closed, I hope. Anybody here say, Brother Avery, I, I know I need to give my life to Jesus, but I'm struggling. Just pray for me. I want to do the right thing. You want to just lift a hand and say, yeah, I, I, want, I want to surrender all to Jesus. I want to give my life to him. I, I see that. I, I'm, anybody else? I see that. I see that. Anybody else? I'm just, I'm struggling with that. Just help, just pray for me. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see that hand. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the wonderful, wonderful message of the gospel, the good news. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. The good news is we don't have to try to save ourselves. The good news is the righteousness that you gave, the sins you bore on the cross that were our sins. We can take that righteousness, Lord, and by faith be accepted in the beloved. Lord, thank you tonight. Remember those who lifted hands. Remember those who stand here tonight praying with the pastor. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.